Hi friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer is perhaps one of the most iconic ships to come out of Star Wars. Which is quite impressive because this is a franchise known for iconic ships. From the X-Wing to the Millennium Falcon, there is no shortage in great designs. But the Star Destroyer, with its awe-inspiring size and very aggressive shape and design, is something quite different. It's far more than just a space vessel. One does not simply dream of piloting a Star Destroyer, one dreams of commanding it. This is no mere ship of the line, it's a massive beast of war that melts its enemies down into molten metal with dozens of turbolasers. Its crew of over 30,000 are like cells within an organism. Their battle stations are essential organs that keep the beast running at high efficiency. Yet for most of its operating lifespan, the Imperial-class Star Destroyer was not even involved in that many major battles against large enemy ships. For the most part, it spent its time chasing down pirates and rubbles and backwards at our rim planets. It's the equivalent of sending an aircraft carrier to a rural town to bust a meth lab. The Imperial Clan Star Destroyer was overkill for most of its deployments. And ultimately, the mass production of these ships were responsible for the downfall of the Empire as much as the destruction of the first Death Star was. So what was the point of the ship? Why would the Empire invest so much money on an inefficient design? Well, before we begin today's episode, a special word from our sponsor for today's episode, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is a very popular turn-based RPG with a heavy emphasis on character progression, dungeon crawling, and looting. Along with a huge roster of unlockable characters, there are over 16 different factions, including orcs, the undead, witches, and other more sketchy groups that you can recruit from. You guys know I love humanity, so I typically run with the Sacred Order homies and the Bannerlord bros. Once you begin to specialize in recruiting champions from specific factions, you can actually unlock special faction-based missions. Unfortunately, right now, the only faction I have enough characters in are the High Elves, so I mainly use them for faction battles. Uh, High Elves are okay, I guess. They're just really caught up in the past all the time and always bemoaning the youth and self-confidence of humanity. Generally, they're just downers to be around, so I am trying to recruit more humans for my army. My favorite character so far is the Holy Paladin named Aethel. She's a level 18 and a 3-star recruit. It means her potential is limited compared to a 4-star recruit, but most of those guys are spewing demons out of their heads from another dimension, so that doesn't really fit my playstyle. She's actually one of the starting champions, so I've known her since level 1, and we've developed quite a relationship my wife doesn't know quite yet. But it's important to build up a strong roster so you can be at your best when competing against the raid community in epic tournaments for rare prizes and gear. And coming later this month is the new arena tournament mode, so watch out for that. If you guys want to check out this game, it is free, and we've linked it down in the description below. If you are a new player, you'll get 100,000 silver and 50 gems along with one free champion and one energy refill if you click on our link. Well, thank you for our patience. Now onto the rest of the video. The Imperial Class Star Destroyer, or ISD, at its core was not a product of modern military strategy or modern military design. Sure, it looked modern, had the most up-to-date equipment and technology on board, and very minimalistic color schemes, but the core design philosophy of the ship is quite antiquated, which is why it's very easy for modern snub fighter groups to take apart this ship, as we see time and time again during the Galactic Civil War. And it's not just because the Rebels have a massive amount of plot armor, they definitely do. The Rebels also have a very clear technological advantage when it comes to their starfighters, and they hold that advantage for almost the entire war. A lot of people believe the Imperial Class Star Destroyer is a direct descendant of the Venator Class Star Destroyer. Both these ships only really share a class distinction. Other than that, they're completely different. These two large vessels were clearly made for different purposes and different naval philosophies. The ISD has a ridiculous amount of weapons and placements, over 70 turbo laser turrets and 60 ion cannons. The Venator Class Star Destroyer in comparison only had 10 turbo lasers and 4 heavy proton torpedo launchers. But what the Republic ship did have was the capacity to carry over 400 starfighters in a massive hangar with a door that runs along the spine of the ship. It's a structural weakness, but it can also launch a ridiculous amount of ships all at once. So basically, the Venator class Star Destroyer was a carrier first and a Star Destroyer second. But honestly, after taking a closer look at the ship and its armament and how it performs in battle, it's not really a destroyer, it's more like a light cruiser. But those 400 starfighters, many of which can be equipped with hyperdrives, are the real offensive and defensive power behind a Venator. If a Venator-class star destroyer can spot an ISD before it can spot the Venator, then it can usually send all of its starfighters and destroy the Imperial ship before the Imperial ship knows where those starfighters are coming from. 
The ISD, on the other hand, can only carry around 72 fighters, and they have to emerge through a much smaller hangar door, and the fighters on board are mainly used for short-range interception. But the ISD is no more of a destroyer than the Venator class Star Destroyer. You see, a destroyer, according to modern naval terminology, is a fast maneuverable ship designed to escort larger flagships or convoys. What the ISD instead is an old school battleship. Battleships have two main qualities. One is they are designed to be heavily armored and take a large amount of punishment. And two, they should have multiple batteries with large caliber guns so that they can dish out punishment. In our own naval history, battleships started emerging on the scene in the late 19th century. They used to be at the center of every modern fleet and would exchange terrifying volleys of fire with other battleships from miles away. But by World War II, battleships saw their invincibility disappear in a flash. First, there was the sneak attack on Pearl Harbor by Japanese carrier-based planes, which devastated the U.S. Pacific carrier fleets. And then there was the German battleship Bismarck, which was chased down by a fleet of smaller Allied ships and eventually sunk. And then in the last year of the war, the mighty Japanese battleship Yamato was sent on a one-way suicide mission to Okinawa, where it was supposed to beach itself and be used as defensive fortifications and artillery supports. Unfortunately, it never even made it there. It was sunk on the way by a barrage of torpedoes and dive bombers. In the post-World War II era, battleships were no longer at the center of your modern naval fleet. This torch had been shifted to the aircraft carrier. Even during World War II, there were very few incidents where battleships would actually duel against each other in either theater of the war. Everyone was starting to realize that the weapons of the future were not giant artillery shells, but guided missiles, nukes, and long-range bombers. These all made thick, heavy armor on the battleship completely pointless. And so the great battleships of World War II were mainly delegated to fire support missions from then on. And that was because the battleship was essentially a gigantic artillery platform that could be set off the coast of Korea, Vietnam, and even Iraq. And they could accurately hit targets more than 20 miles inland. And also, artillery shells are so much cheaper than guided missiles or cruise missiles. Now, some battlefields would be refitted with Tomahawk cruise missiles and other modern weapon systems, but the ships of today are mainly fast, stealthy, and can hit targets from several hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. The battleship just became too heavy and too expensive to keep in operation. And so, when I look at the Clone Wars and compare it to the Galactic Civil War, despite happening earlier in history, the Clone Wars is the more modern battle from a naval strategy standpoint. On the Republic side, you had fleets based around carriers, on the separatist side, you had fleets made up of the Star Wars equivalent of guided missile destroyers. The Confederacy military had the best missiles and torpedo technology throughout the war, and although they were more expensive per round than turbolaser fire, they packed a huge amount of damage and had a much longer range. So yeah, it's pretty safe to say that the Empire did not invest in a very practical ship design. Why would they do this? Well, you see, although the finest engineers and scientists designed the Imperial-class Star Destroyer, they did it at the specifications of Emperor Palpatine. Palpatine wasn't a military expert. He wasn't some kind of brilliant engineer. He was just a dirty old man who also happened to be a Sith Lord. And like all Sith Lords during the Rule of Two era, Palpatine had collected a huge amount of information about the extinct Sith Empire and its previous attempts to take over the galaxy. The Sith Empire had always been a thorn in the side of the Republic and the Jedi. The average Sith warrior was always better than your average Jedi or Republic soldier, and that was because they were fueled by the dark side in combat sims. And so the Sith Empire brought the Republic to its knees several times. And like any religious organization, they had traditions and symbols that they liked to use, including a wedge shape when it came to their capital ships. Take a look, for instance, at this Harrower-class Dreadnought from the Sith Empire circa 4980 BBY, or this Interdictor-class cruiser used by Revan Sith Fleet in 3950 BBY. Now, some historians argue that the wedge tier shaped structure allows for a maximum field of firing for all weapons and placements. Others have suggested that the wedge shape gives the rear of the ship, where the engines and hyperdrives are located, maximum protection. While these might be good points from a practical standpoint, there's also a psychological effect of seeing what is essentially a giant dagger flying straight towards you. It's aggressive and absolutely terrifying. And the Sith love feeding off of other people's fears. While that might not be the most practical reason for a ship design, the Sith were hardly ever practical. Whenever they did manage to defeat the Republic and the Jedi, the Sith's rule would almost always end because of infighting and backstabbing. The Sith were completely chaotic and their actions weren't always the most sane. Now, because the Separatist Alliance were essentially a false flag operation that was controlled by Palpatine, when the Clone Wars ended, it ended abruptly. Anakin Skywalker was sent to take care of the High Command of the Separatists, and most of the Separatist droid army was deactivated remotely. It was as efficient as any cessation of major operations can be. And so in the first years of the Empire, the transitional JAR army was more than enough to handle what remaining Separatist holdouts there were left. 
The majority of the fighting at this point was ground-based anyway, with Imperial garrisons trying to wipe out guerrilla forces on the ground. In space, there weren't really any warlords or separatist holdouts with significant naval assets, and so the Star Destroyer wasn't really necessary. But when it did appear over a system, the damage that it did was more psychological than anything else. Orbital bombardments are not the best idea when you're trying to win the hearts and minds of the local people. What the Empire was really dealing with was just a huge numbers problem. The lack of control that the Galactic Republic had over its outer rim didn't necessarily change overnight with the rise of the New Order. The Galactic Empire still had the same millions of systems that the Republic did. And although Papatine had done a great job making sure to increase the military size, it was still far from large enough to truly cover every corner of the galaxy. The Galactic Empire still heavily depended on planetary and local defense forces. There was no military in the universe large enough to cover the entire Empire. So whether it's 25,000 Imperial class Star Destroyers or half a million smaller and cheaper Nebulon B escort frigates, it doesn't really matter. There will be gaps in the coverage no matter what. Or at least that's what top Imperial military officials theorized. Grand Moff Wilhelm Tarkin was a close confidant of the Emperor and one of the Imperial military's lead strategists. He proposed a concept which would later turn into the Tarkin Doctrine. Instead of trying to project forces to every corner of the galaxy, the Empire would project extreme strength from the central government and military force. The idea was to make the cost of treason or dissidence so high that no one would dare to disobey the Empire. This is what led to the destruction of Alderaan. It had been rumored that rebel forces had created weapons caches all over the planet, and that news alone was enough to justify the annihilation of an entire world with a deep history of high human culture. To men like Tarkin and Palpatine, who actively fought against individual liberty and freedom, the idea of suppressing your entire population through fear was very promising. And so, although the Star Destroyer, with its huge crew, massive power plant, and dominating size might have been a bit overkill for a convoy escort mission or occupation over an Outer Rim world, the idea was to make it seem like the Empire had unlimited resources and even the smallest disturbances would warrant the visitation of a massive Star Destroyer. More importantly, a Nebulon B frigate or an Imperial light cruiser can get destroyed by rebel ships, and that would shatter this important image of Imperial invincibility. People generally only rebel for causes that have a hope in winning. When you see an Imperial class Star Destroyer, that usually destroys all hope and makes any effort of going against the Empire suicidal. And so a Star Destroyer, which is a mile long and floating in the air, is a very powerful symbol to keep over a city you want to occupy. Its looming presence squeezes out the hope of any potential rubble far more efficiently than a task force of smaller ships. If the Death Star had never been destroyed at Yavin 4, who knows what would have happened to the Empire. So there you have it guys, we believe that the Star Destroyer was designed as a psychological weapon more than it was a practical functioning ship for the Imperial military. But we'd like to hear your thoughts in the comment section below, so please leave them. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. And as usual, thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.